My name is Jimmy Wu. I'm the case manager at Inside Riders. I was unfortunately incarcerated from the ages of 16 to 29 and a half, served a total of 13 and a half years. And I am now working with formerly incarcerated young people, just using my past negative experiences in a very positive way. Because I didn't know what I was supposed to do. I didn't have anyone to turn to. It's not an excuse, okay? I'm not saying it's an excuse. It's a reason. It's an explanation. So, you know, when I was just out there with my friends, my my decision making was completely way off. I thought, hey, you know, as long as I go and I take a car, it's just a car. I'm not going to be hurting anyone. I'm not going to go and, you know, kill someone or, you know, hurt them in any way physically. I didn't understand emotional trauma. Even though I was going through it myself, I didn't know that what I was going to do was going to inflict emotional trauma upon innocent, you know, people. My name is Donna Groman and I am the supervising judge of the Juvenile Delinquency Court here in Los Angeles County. Well, I think that uh, Prop 21 was based on a lot of myths. Um, supporters of Prop 21 talked about these super predators, talking about kids as being super predators and I think really shocked the public into believing that um, they were going to be subject to this great mayhem by uh, gang-involved youth who were going to be toting machine guns. And um, I think based upon that fear that was created, the voters thought that they really needed to enact this uh, proposition that was going to lead to adult sentences for young people. It's like if you do an adult crime, you're going to do an adult sentence without any recognition whatsoever that um, what we know now about the science of the developing brain and how young people are not many adults, uh, that their brains are still developing until their 20s and should not be held to the same standards as adults. They just don't have that same capability as adults do in terms of impulse control and even being able to understand the consequences of their actions. I'm now Bernstein and I'm the author of Burning Down the House, The End of Juvenile Prison. I had to grapple with the notion of the super predator, which is this idea that a couple decades old now and entirely discredited, but still very much in the culture, that we need harsh laws because we've got a generation of young people of color, and it was very exclusively a racialized idea, who are, you know, heartless, soulless, no concern about others, would just as soon kill you as take your iPhone. Just a really ugly portrait. You have to give kids a chance. If they're not mentally mature, and its research has proven you don't reach maturity until the age, uh, mental maturity by the age of 25, you have to give them a chance. Throwing them in prison where they are only going to learn to do uh, worse things, that's not, the, that's not the answer. And these are people's lives at stake. It's not about making money. And I know oftentimes it can get really money because you know it is a money-making machine. We all know that with mass incarceration and everything else, overcrowding issues in California. It has to be about the well-being of people's lives. What is most frustrating is the delay and, and time that it takes to provide help to our young people. For kids who are having problems in school um, and are being arrested for school-based offenses, school fights, um, assaults, uh, criminal threats, if they were dealt with immediately at the school level, I think that they have a much better chance of being successfully rehabilitated instead of wending their way through the juvenile justice system, waiting out in our waiting rooms with um, older youth who are more criminally sophisticated, who then become their peers, uh, waiting for services that um, may be too expensive for their families or may not be available and have waiting lists. Um, I just think we need to look at the best place for our young people to get help and that's where it should occur and it's not the juvenile justice system. 
Prison is not a place for rehabilitation. It has always been designed for punishment. I don't care what people say because I have been there. I've seen the rehabilitation efforts that, that are not in place. I was going to say in place in prison, but they're, that are not in place. Isolation is painful for anyone. And I think that's why we impose it as a punishment, even if we don't use the word punishment. But for teenagers in particular, when you think about the developmental challenges of adolescents, the, the sort of developmental tasks that they're supposed to go through in order to, to get to adulthood, they're all about connection and relationship and who they are in terms of in, a, in, in the context of other people, like learning to form close trusting relationships. Well, that's taboo inside prison. You know, that's exactly what you have to unlearn. Figuring out who you are and who you want to be in relation to the world. There's no avenue to do that. Even something like learning to be accountable for your actions, which is a justification for isolating kids, is actually impossible in a locked room. If your crime has a victim, you have no access to that victim. If you've hurt your family, if you've done damage to your community, you're taken out of relationship and so you can't uh, in any way even be accountable. So everything that a young person needs to do in order to be a successful adult is relational. And I think that's why isolation is so profoundly destructive for adolescents. It's not pleasant to be inside a small room where you have really ugly colors, a horrible stench, you know, these dark colors, and you have like nothing. You know, in some cases, all you have are your boxers on your body and nothing else. So it's really difficult. The degree to which we obscure what's going on with language is just phenomenal. I was chastised, for example, for using the word cell to describe the cells in which the children are kept. You know, I mean, they're eight by 11, there's a metal toilet, there's a bunk, there may be a desk. But I was told that's not a cell, that's a room. I was told not to use the word guard, even though, you know, the guy had not only a big ring of keys, but pepper spray on his belt. But these were counselors and youth workers. So we have a whole lexicon that we use to hide what we're doing from ourselves and from the public. But when you go inside one of these places, it just could not be clearer what these kids are in prison. I was in and out of solitary confinement, you know, uh, in Central Juvenile Hall, and I can say that it was a horrible, it's a horrible feeling because we as humans are social creatures. Okay, we want to be around people. Even if you are incarcerated, you're still around people. You're able to finally, you know, uh, to find some people that you can really relate to. Solitary confinement is a particular concern because uh, the international consensus and the research consensus is that its primary and consistent effect is to drive people crazy. Uh, and that's what it does. You know, people have psychotic breaks. They bang their heads against the wall. Uh, kids have talked about seeing their neighbors try to commit suicide in a solitary cell by diving from the bunk because every other avenue for escape by ending their lives has been taken out. And one of the most troubling things that I heard from kids was that solitary, solitary confinement is a response to not just serious safety issues, but it can be something that kids go through when they arrive to be sorted can be done for their own safety, it can be done to keep gangs separate, but the most heartbreaking thing to me was to learn that it's a standard response when a kid expresses a desire to kill herself. So a, a young woman talked about another girl talking about killing herself, and a SWAT team essentially rushes in and strips her clothing off and throws her naked into a bare solitary cell. So it should be no surprise that suicides are much more common in solitary confinement than they are in the general population. Even though technically she's naked with nothing but a single blanket and a bare cell and maybe a drain to protect her.
it's going to be the worst experience you can ever imagine. A lot of people literally drive themselves crazy because they, they are completely isolated from any type of human interaction. My research assistant talked about getting into a fight on the basketball court while he was locked up and have and being not just pepper sprayed but having a guard approach him with a device that was a fogger meant to clear a room in the case of a riot and spray it directly into his eyes and then from there be placed in solitary without any medical attention or any opportunity to clean himself. I just think the time that, that our young people spend in juvenile hall is way too long as um, we in the juvenile justice system try to get their cases through the various stages. Uh, and the consequences of them being um, incarcerated is that they come into contact with youth who are more criminally sophisticated, possibly more violent or gang involved, and it's really a learning ground for how to be a better kid than it is for um, them to learn the skills that they need to learn to become um, better citizens. Right, so you have these young people that are still capable of being taught all these critical skills that they're going to need to have a successful reentry, successful life out here. But we're not really, not we're not really doing our part, you know, to really provide them those opportunities. So it's very hard to match um, uh, exactly what they were doing at school before. A lot of the kids end up repeating material that they've already gone through because it's um, a different program. Uh, there's also the problem of when they get out of the facility of trying to re-enter and um, finding their place in the community when they've missed out on a lot of what has transpired in their regular school environment. So a lot of kids just never recover from that interruption in their learning. If you have under a ninth grade reading level, then you are forced to go and you know take on some educational classes. These classes are a joke. Okay, a lot of the teachers that are teaching, you know, they're not there for the right reasons. They're, it's like babysitting. I just come show up. I throw a textbook in front of these inmates. As long as they're not fighting, you know, amongst themselves or killing each other, that's all that really matters. I mean, every uh, disruption of their education is going to um, lead to negative results and. I, I think that a young person's connection to the education system is probably the most protective factor that there is and when you interrupt that and take them out of their learning environment then you're taking away that support which may never be regained. One of the things that people are beginning to talk about is the difference between what we're willing to invest in incarcerating a kid and what we're willing to invest in educating a kid. And I think nationwide, we spend something like $80,000 a year to, to lock a kid up, and an average of about 10000 a year to educate a kid. In California, the numbers just kind of went off the charts. At its height, it cost $225,000 a year to keep a kid in the California Youth Authority. And over that same period, education spending dropped to 8000 something per kid. So it just couldn't be clearer. We were disinvesting in kids because we were over-investing in, in controlling them. And the really sad thing about that statistic is the kids know it. The message that they get from that is this society will spend anything to control me, but nothing to invest in. It costs a lot less uh, to our community to have um, a young person um, spend the time in the community as opposed to being locked away. Um, our camp system, um, our camps are in very remote locations, so it's very difficult for parents to visit. Uh, so it's much better when there are community solutions 
uh, that are available to our young people. I think that a lot of people that are unfamiliar with, uh, you know, the population that, you know, I was once a part of, you know, the juvenile incarcerated population, they don't understand that, you know, when you hear of other kids going through certain things and that it's not really affecting you, you have to understand that it is affecting you. Because number one, you're pay we're all, we're all taxpayers now, right? So you're paying for the you know these kids to be incarcerated. And if you don't care about the system on uh, on the macro level, on a much broader, larger scale, then hey, your tax dollars, tax dollars, excuse me, are going to uh, you know these pr pr the, the prison industrial complex for all the wrong reasons. Right, and at some point, these kids that you don't care about, they are going to be coming home. When I was reporting the book, and I would tell casual acquaintances that I was writing a book that advocated abolishing juvenile prisons, the question that I got the most frequently was, um, "Well, when the, the, if that's what you think, where are you going to put them?" And I, it, I started thinking about how stuck on the idea of put we were. In other words, the question wasn't, if you're going to end juvenile prison, what do you suggest we do instead when there's a crime? It was, where are you going to put them? So I feel like in a lot of conversations, I have to try to push back against the premise that locking a person in a room for a period of time is a natural consequence, because it's not. It's just one of many ways that we could intervene.